So thank you everyone for joining us today um, to this uh, webinar hosted by Mashab MCTC. Uh, my name is Sarah Wilner and I'm the Deputy Director of the Mashab Carmel Training Center, which is a training facility under Mashab, Israel's Agency for International Cooperation. We are so happy today to be hosting the Executive Director of Beit Izi Shapiro, uh, Mr. Amir Lerner, who will be talking to us about people with disabilities during the coronavirus crisis. Before we start, a few logistics. Uh, you are all muted, so please keep it that way. If you have any questions, please feel free to use the chat at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we'll be responding and commenting on any of the questions at the end of the session after Amir has finished his lecture. Uh, this session is being recorded, so for anyone who's missed the, the session afterwards, uh, we'll be sending the link to anyone who would like. Um, and uh, I think we will begin. I want to give uh, a short description of Mr. Amir Lerner, who is, now, who is executive director at Beit Easy Shapiro. Amir began his career as a navigator in the Air Force. He's a, he then served for 22 years in the prime minister's office, where his last two positions were deputy director of logistics and security and director of the leadership school. Three years ago, Amir left the prime minister's office to join the social sector. He worked at Education Cities as a member of the management team, after which he joined the Mandel School for Educational Leadership Fellowship Program. Amir holds a first degree in economics and banking from the London School of Economics and an MBA from the Herzliya Interdisciplinary Center. Thank you so much, Amir, for, for joining us today, and I'm going to pass it on to you. Very much, uh, Sarah, everybody can hear me? It's, is it? Okay. Yeah. Great, so it's a pleasure to be here and to talk to all of you today a little bit about what Beit Easy Shapiro is and what we've been doing over the past uh, two months to deal with the uh, COVID-19 and to see how we can continue improving the life of people with disabilities because that's what Beit Easy Shapiro is all about. We're a 40-year-old organization. Our founder just last week won the, the Israel Prize, which is the highest civil honor uh, that can, any, anybody can receive in Israel for lifetime achievement, for a lifetime achievement. And her achievement is Beit Easy Shapiro, the achievement of hers and of all of us together. So we're very proud this week uh, and all the time of, uh, of having Naomi Stuchner as our founder. And through her leadership uh, over, over these years, Beit Easy Shapiro has really been able to change the way people in Israel, uh, their attitudes towards the people, to people with disabilities and the services that people with disabilities get and, many, and much, much more. Beit Easy Shapiro is really a pioneer in this area, and we have a very, very unique strategy of how we work and what we do. And that impacts a lot of the things, a lot of the ways we work. Uh, we're all the time looking for what's needed. What are the needs in society? And these past two months have been very uh, challenging from that respect. And then we develop new services, new solutions. We research them uh, very methodically. We show that they work. And then we try to share this knowledge which is made with as many people as possible, like what we're doing today, but in also many, many other ways. And we're, we're in effect, we're an open source organization. Uh, we like to share our knowledge, we like to give it away. Being a nonprofit is very, uh, that helps us a lot in that respect. And also the way we've decided to fund ourselves over the years, to make sure that we can maintain the strategy uh, because we barely uh, use government funding at all. We're not a service provider, a provider, that's important to understand. We're an organization that develops, uh, researches, develops, and distributes. And this way really can impact annually so many people uh, in Israel and worldwide. Because another thing that uh, specializes us, that's unique about us, about us, is that we combine two areas of nonprofits which are usually separate. One of them is the fact that we develop and provide services the services that we think that we have a very specific added value in them. And the other thing that we do is we advocate. We have a whole arm of advocacy and of social change. And the fact that we do both of these uh, is very, very special. And it gives us all these uh, insights, unique insights into the world of disabilities and how we can better have an impact on, the, on society in general. Because that's what we're always looking to have the widest impact. <clears throat> we're globally recognized. That means we have partners throughout the world. And if, if a new partnership is born out of this session, then I'll be very, very happy. We're all the time looking with whom we can team up and how we can do more together. We're working together 
with 13, 30 partners uh, around the world, some of them on consulting, some of them uh, researching together, working with ac academics and with governments and with uh, businesses around the world. And a lot of these connections have come through our special status uh, in the United Nations as a consultant there. We're there annually uh, in the past uh, six years. We'll continue being part of that. And we're also uh, part of the organizations in Israel who are like the, the watchdog of the government to see that the CPDR is uh, implemented accurately in Israel. So COVID-19 opened up a lot of challenges for us. And, and from the very start, we were seeking ways in which we could have uh, the best impact and on bettering the lives of people with disabilities during these difficult times. And what I'll try to describe to you now are a few of the things we've done, not all of them, just so you can get an idea. And like Sarah said before, you're free to ask questions and I'll try to answer as many of them possible at the end. But the first thing we did was open a hotline. So we realized that people uh, are getting into stress over the being uh, alone in their homes or uh, not being able to go outside at all. We opened a hotline in three languages and we advertised it as much as possible. So we know that over 100,000 people in Israel uh, know about this uh, hotline. And we've gotten many calls and we've helped many people through this hotline. But we realized very quickly that it's not enough. They're not many, that a lot of people do not understand that they, can get, that they can get help and that they need help and that we can help them. So we have in Israel three centers uh, throughout Israel that deal with over 600 families almost on a daily basis. And we proactively approached all these families and asked them, can we help you? Do you need help? Uh, how are you handling this new situation? And what we realized is that these conversations that we thought would be five or 10 minutes turned into hour long conversations. So people were thirsty for somebody to talk to, for somebody who could understand them, who, who understands the special challenges of families with somebody with disability in them are dealing with. And, and these are people who would not have called up uh, and, or initiated a call with us. Uh, this proactive work uh, approaching over two, close to 200 families over the past two months has been a major help. And what you can see here is one of the children uh, who wrote in Hebrew, thank you for being with us during this time. That was also uh, not enough. Uh, we want to see how we could have more of an impact. And since we all the time are dealing with social change and advocacy, we have uh, 17 different leadership groups. And one of them that we facilitate, and one of them that you see here in the picture, uh, obviously in pro-COVID days, uh, just a, a memory of how we used to sit around a table. Uh, this is a group uh, which crosses many different types of disabilities and whose focus as a leadership group is on health and how health services can be accessible to all. And they understood there was a big uh, gap between what the government is offering, what the health services are offering, and what people with disabilities need. So they opened up a hotline connected to the hotline that I mentioned before. So anybody with a disability could ask, you know, how can I get such and such a service? Or why isn't this service accessible for me? And all the information was collected by these uh, people who are sitting around the table and they'd answer the questions and give all the specific information. Also a lot of information about what are my rights during this time and how can I maximize uh, utilizing these rights over this period. So this group was very, very active. They were active with people, with the people with disabilities calling them, but they were also active with government and municipalities because they know who to speak to and how to get the message out and that, together with our advocacy group, which is a, a coalition that we need in Israel, or the, or a coalition of over 30 organizations, we were able to affect the different policies of government throughout this time. Uh, from small things, like uh, when coming back to school now, uh, special education school has returned in Israel, there was a limitation that you can come back to school as long as the school can maintain two meters difference between the students and between the student and the teacher, which, as you probably know, is practically impossible when you're talking about uh, small children with disabilities uh, who need help uh, sometimes in, in daily needs. So uh, we had to work with government a lot in order to change the regulations, not only for us, but for all the different organizations that deal with disabilities in Israel. And that, that's, again, part of what we're all the time doing is thinking about the society, society as a whole, and not only about the services that we provide in Beit Z Shapiro. So we try, like I said, to care and to work with the, with the families that we deal with, the families uh, in general in Israel through the hotline, and also through advocacy as much as possible to make changes in the way government, uh, government treats people with disabilities throughout a crisis like this. 
we're also learning a lot and uh, intending to continue doing this work with government because this will probably not be the last crisis. And uh, we understand now exactly where the gaps and the problems are and we'll continue dealing. Another area that's very important to us is education. At Bedizi Shapiro, we have a special education school, uh, kindergarten and uh, nursery schools. So we have children ages uh, six months through 12. And it was very important for us to continue that education. Uh, we understood even before the school started that we'll have to do something. So immediately the first day that uh, the school system uh, stopped, we opened up a virtual nursery school. What you see here in Hebrew is, uh, are the six days of the week and each day there are three different activities. Uh, we filmed these in advance. Uh, so we were ready once the school system uh, stopped. And every day another three or four uh, activities are loaded up line and they're viewed by, by people uh, in our system, but also throughout Israel. And you can see that it's not just, it's, it's therapeutic activities as well, speech and language skills, physiotherapy sessions, uh, occupational therapy sessions, many, many different uh, types of sessions, and also uh, more leisurely types of sessions. And uh, this is a Shabbat ceremony. These uh, videos have been very, very successful. We've had tens of thousands of views. Uh, these videos were made for 45 uh, children. Okay, so we, we know that our, these videos are viewed by people throughout the country uh, and we're getting great feedback on that. In fact, uh, we understood how successful that w this was that last week uh, we started a nursery school like this in Arabic as well. And we've already uploaded, uh, it's now the Ramadan uh, holiday for the, in the Muslim world. Uh, so we've already uploaded uh, six videos and they've already had thousands of views. Uh, which are around uh, subjects re related to the Ramadan. And we're going to continue doing that even though schools are coming back in, and the nursery schools as well. We also have a virtual school uh, for our kids, which are 6 to 12 years old. Again, we started with making movies, uh, short clips uh, at our, on our premises and doing them with a professional photographer. Uh, but once we couldn't do that anymore, the teachers continue working from home and uploading videos you can see together with their families. Uh, so this kind of con so the education was actually continuous throughout this whole uh, period of crisis. And it was also fun to play games. Uh, we had a holiday during this uh, season, the Passover holiday. And uh, this is the bingo game related on that. And the stars you see on the Zoom is not a function you're not aware of in Zoom. It's just uh, kids that uh, do, we do not want to show their faces online. So we put the stars over. So in doing distance learning, uh, what we're trying to do is, is to provide support and solutions for children and parents uh, with disabilities who are actually quarantined at home for uh, close to two months uh, under very difficult situ conditions. We wanted them to have something to do and also to maintain a sense of routine, which we realize is so important, especially for children with disabilities. And also to continue providing the therapeutic uh, sessions as much as possible. And what we learned here, and we learned uh, also in other areas that I'll, I'll touch on later, is, is that there are disadvantages to doing these things online, but there are also sometimes advantages. And uh, we realize that when you do physiotherapy, for example, online, then there's suddenly this relationship between the child, the parent, and the therapist that doesn't exist when you're doing it one-on-one, -on -one, uh, a one-on-one -on -one, uh, physiotherapy session because you're actually telling the parent what to do with the child, and this creates a very unique relationship which we don't know much to say about it now, but like I said at the beginning, Betis Shabir, we find new solutions, we research them, and, and then we develop them. So we're at the research stage now, and we're start trying to understand exactly what these advantages are and how they outweigh or do not outweigh the disadvantages of online therapy so we can continue providing it even after this crisis is over. And as you can see in the slide, the online sessions were, some of them were group sessions, sometimes they were live, some of them they were one-on-one, -on -one. And some of them pre-recorded ones that I showed you before. Then we did the work together with the parents. Uh, a lot of the work was with them. And I think what we realized here, which was uh, again new to us, that a lot of families that aren't used to working with technology, that don't like working with technology, suddenly were drawn into this and began using technology more and more. And, and we understand that this is gonna be a, a real a significant uh, stepping stone when we look further on what we wanna do in the future. 
suddenly we have a population who is much more uh, technologically and computer literate. I will have to know, we'll have to find the ways to utilize that uh, as we continue to the next steps and be more and more with technology. And we're already seeing uh, these, these, breakthrough, these breakthroughs. But the whole issue of dealing with technology and how to work with technology is something that Beatriz Shapiro has been very interested in for many years. Uh, we understand that just having technology isn't enough. You have to know how to implement it. And we've developed ways to implement these technologies in the, in the most effective manner. And one of the things that we, we find out is that uh, the underprivileged uh, people in, the, in society do not always have access to enough uh, hardware and technology. Uh, so we worked very hard over this period to, to help people, to loan them these technologies. Uh, we received specific grants for that, and we're, we're still doing that now, uh, uh, loaning out laptops and, uh, and tablets. So families that have a child with a disability can have uh, a tablet or a laptop which is dedicated to, for the use of these children. And it's not just another uh, platform to watch Netflix on. And then once they have it, then we have uh, also uh, assistance for how to use the software and uh, for how to use the hardware and how to use the software. So, so it's not just that we hand them the, the hardware, we're with them throughout the whole process in order to make sure that they're utilizing this in the best uh, po uh, manner possible. And we know how to do these adaptations for the different types of software, for the different types of disabilities, so the families can do this as much as, uh, as in the best way possible. At Beatty Shapiro, we have a technology center uh, that specializes in that with, uh, with, profession, with different professionals who know about technology and speech therapy, occupational therapy, and whatever is needed. This is our dental clinic. Uh, we have a dental clinic, uh, which is, specializes in working with people with disabilities. And uh, this is, you know, during a time like this, this is really a, a being on the front line, a dentist during this time. It's, uh, and you can understand the dangers and you can see how they're equipped. Uh, we were open for emergency services only during this time. And we did uh, quite a few emergency uh, treatments for people with disabilities. It's very, very challenging working with some of them. And, and I brought this picture up because uh, at Beatty Shapiro, we all the time believe that uh, people who, who can't, speak or use technology in order to, to speak should always have this technology available to them. You, know, you can't go through treatment or therapy. None of us can go through treatment or therapy without our mouths. So we can't take the mouths away from people with disabilities. Uh, one of the places we do that, which is quite unique, is in our hydrotherapy pools, which are closed right now. But you, usually when, uh, when people are being treated there and they need to speak using a laptop, then they have their laptops with them in the water during all these therapies. And that was obvious to us. One thing that we didn't do until quite recently during this uh, crisis was having tablets in the dental clinic. And what you see here is a family with their child who, who uh, communicates using a tablet. And what he's writing down now throughout the treatment, he's starting by saying, I'll translate this quickly from Hebrew, is that I don't want it to hurt. And then he says, I'm scared. Then he says, okay, you can start. It'll hurt and it'll be over. And then he said, you guys are, are great. You, know, you guys are great professionals. And, and just this way to communicate uh, using technology is something that, that I think is being enhanced during this crisis because this is the first time that a family has said, okay, let's bring our tablet with us to the dental clinic. And now we're going to uh, see how we can uh, purchase and make sure that we have these tablets available to anybody who comes to the clinic and needs it uh, so we can communicate easily with all the patients coming there. Since technology is important to us, and like I said, sharing our knowledge is also important to us, then throughout this uh, period, we've been doing webinars, uh, international webinars on uh, assistive technologies. Uh, here are two of them, and uh, we'll put you all on our mailing, mailing list if you like, and then you can be invited to future ones as well. One of them is when technology needs communication, the use of augmented alternative communication with children. Another is technology for play and leisure. And these are open and free and, and very, very informative for whoever wants to learn about technology and people with disabilities and assistive technologies. So when we look to the future and uh, what happens last and after this, uh, what happens next? After this, uh, I'll open it up for questions. 
think for, the first thing we understand is that working online is not something which is only for times of crisis. Uh, there are a lot of advantage, a lot of advantages to this. Uh, we see that we're suddenly working with new populations uh, who are far off from our center. We do not have bran many branches in Israel. We have one big center in the center of Israel and two smaller branches, uh, which are very uh, specific to certain communities. And now through online work, we understand that we can work with, with everybody and we can do it effectively. And not only can we do it effectively, but families are more willing to do that. So one of the things we're doing is we understand that throughout this time, uh, people with disabilities have not been getting the amount and the quality of therapies that they, that they do in, under normal circumstances. Uh, so we're offering now a package of uh, online uh, therapies where we'll do this online intake uh, for people throughout the whole country. Literally, we can do it throughout the whole world. Uh, and through this intake, understand what sort of therapies will be best. We can also talk to their current therapists in the communities and then offer them a whole package of therapies that will help them kind of bridge the gap between what they usually get and what they got during the time of, uh, of uh, during the past time of quarantine. And also enables us to give these services to, to areas where there aren't enough qualified uh, therapists. Uh, because they're in the periphery of the country uh, for different reasons. And that way the services of professionals in the more populated areas of Israel will be available to people in the less populated areas of Israel. And like I said, around the world. We know, going to the next bullet, we, we know that one of the main problems with in implementing new technologies is that it's not implemented in all the different circles. When you have a child who has to use assistive technologies, you have to know how to work with a child, with a staff that's working with a child, and with the families. And if one of those circles doesn't work, then you can put the, or what will usually happen is that the technology, the assistive technology will end up in the closet and collect dust. And a lot of the times the challenge is actually working with the families themselves, because we're not with them too often. They're very busy. They bring their children to the daycare centers and they take them in the evening back. And this crisis has, has uh, caused all, or has made all the families work with technologies. And we're sure they're gonna be much more open to the use of technologies now. And we wanna see how we can leverage that in order to assist implementation in uh, populations in Israel that are not really receptive uh, to new technologies. And we're seeing that work already. And the third line of work that we wanna get into as much as possible after the crisis is collecting all of the lessons we've learned through working with the government uh, during this crisis in order to change the regulations to come better prepared. Uh, we've already been working together with the different healthcare organizations in Israel uh, on how to make their services more accessible to people with disabilities, with visible disabilities, with invisible disabilities. And, and we see that there's a huge gap in the knowledge of the uh, of the medical sector and it's not just the, the doctors or the nurses it's also the logistics and the receptionists and everybody in the office has to understand what it means when somebody in a disability with a disability comes in and, and needs to get the same service that anybody else gets but through this crisis we realize that it's not only uh the health organization there's a lot of work to do uh when the when the ministries of finance and education and the ministries of, uh, of welfare are working and creating their regulations, then they'll all the time be thinking about the 80% of the population uh, without disabilities and not about the 20% with the disabilities. Uh, just to give one example, how do you simplify like, these regulations so people with cog cognitive disabilities can understand them? That wasn't done during this crisis and we, we did a lot of work in order to make that available uh, so anybody with a disability could understand what the regulations are. So all this data that we've collected, uh, we're now gonna translate that into policy issues and, how, and see how we can actually work together and change policy with the government. And the last point that I'd like to put out here, and I, I mentioned that also at the very, very beginning, is that after a crisis like this, which is a social crisis, the health crisis, and an economic crisis all bundled up in one, we have to see how we can work together with other organizations. You know, we can't do this alone. Uh, we have to work together. And like I said before, we're all the time looking how do we can connect with other organizations to bring our message forward, uh, to bring our services forward to, to more people and to affect policy. And as always, just see how we can better 
work better in order to change society so it'll be a more equal one for everybody, including people with disabilities. So that was my message to you. Uh, thank you. And I'd be happy to take uh, any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, Amir. Um, that was great. Okay, we have a few questions here um, from Harmit. Have you developed any app or a YouTube channel? And can you elaborate um, which tools do you use to impart the virtual learning that you're doing? The virtual learning is basically on, it's, it's uh, uh, short clips that are put on a YouTube channel and I'll be able to send you the link to the YouTube channel uh, later on happily. Uh, so that, that's the main, and we, we made this format on our webpage, which I showed you for, which uh, just has links to the YouTube uh, channel. So you can access it either from here or from there. Uh, another thing we're doing now with the Arabic, uh, with the videos in Arabic, is that we're making sure they all have uh, subtitles on them. So they'll be accessible also from different countries who, who speak different uh, types of Arabic. Types isn't the right word, but uh, I understand. <laughs> Okay, uh, we also have, by the way, uh, a set of apps I'll show you later on, but that's not part of the virtual uh, learning. I'll show you that uh, before we finish. That was another question, if you have any apps that you're using. Uh, okay, well, I'll show it to you now. Uh, we develop apps, again, based on, because we have these daycare centers with us, then we're all the time seeing what can be used and how we can work better. And we're working together with the SAP and now with the Amdocs, also high, uh, high tech companies in Israel to develop these different uh, apps. They're simple ones like Easy Dice, which uh, enables uh, children with disabilities who can't use their hands to throw dice and play games with dice. And uh, also Easy Board, which enables uh, to teach children with disabilities how to, how to type, how to type their names. And there are all kinds, of, I won't go into in depth, uh, but you can download all of these from the different app stores. Easy Sign helps work with children on uh, developing sign language and different gestures and how you can communicate using that. And, and for those of you who celebrate Hanukkah, then there's a dreidel, which is a dreidel app. And soon we'll have a new one, Easy Doc, which will help uh, children work with documents uh, online as well, children, people with disabilities in general. Okay, that's great. Um, another question that's written here is, how do you decide who can apply to borrow the devices, um, especially during these challenging times. Yeah. It's usually, it'll be through our, uh, the first ones we distributed to people who we've been working with for many years and we know them and we know their situation and we understood immediately that once we're all going online, if we don't give them some sort of hardware, they won't be with us and we didn't want to lose them. Uh, so we gave it to them. There weren't any. Of that. that was the criteria through knowledge. Uh, we have social workers working with us and the, the daycare center managers. Uh, but as we develop this more, uh, and now we're, we're purchasing another 20 already, so that goes beyond our uh, the families that we work with. And we're together with this developing a criteria. So I don't have any answer to that yet. But uh, we do understand that we need criteria for that. So whoever wrote that question, I'll be happy to share that with you once we have something developed. So that goes into the, the next part of that question, which is um, what, what would be your suggestion for countries like India, where they have ample challenges, a big population, diverse, and a lot of inequality in terms of resources? What would I suggest? Yeah. Um, <laughs> difficult question. I mean, India has a lot of uh, huge challenges and huge problems, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm only uh, the chief executive of Beatty Shapiro in Israel, so recommending something for all of uh, India is uh, is difficult. But I would say that if you if you raise the bar high, then people rise up to it, and, and that's a general leadership uh, advice that I would give. So you know, I'll give you an example uh, at the beginning. Uh, we found it difficult to convince uh, our employees in the, in the Arab sector for several reasons, cultural mainly, to film themselves. So they didn't want these films going around. But then once we got the budget and we started looking for people, uh, for professionals, actors who would do these uh, movies, then they rose to the challenge and said, you know what, we'll do it. And now, and you know, we're very proud and very happy that at the end we're, all, we're doing this all in-house with our own employees. 
uh, who are willing to do this. So we raised the bar, and we challenged them, and they rose to it. And we also see that when uh, you provide the people with the technology, then they'll use it. And, uh, and, and we also know, I mean, it's hard to say, you know, a lot of people should work together now because you can't really be one near the other. Uh, but I think that's, that's the best advice I can give. Uh, I think another thing we're trying to do, which would be relevant now, is to put our, uh, our virtual school on a VOD channel for free, that we'll have a special VOD channel for children with disabilities, that all these videos will be uh, available to anybody who, who's there. So that's something that can also address a large population. I hope I answered that one. It's a hard question, you're right. <laughs> it's a difficult one. Um, I think following that question, um, maybe there's a question on how can we help children with disabilities who are living in places without technologies? Uh, and who don't have access to too much to too much technology? What can we do with them? That that would be working, I think, with the with the families, and that's what we're doing with the, with our family centers is just proactively approaching them and and talking to them and having the the listening ear, and and I think what we've realized with the with the use of technology is that the parents can be a huge help in this. Uh, and you don't need technology for that. I mean, if you do have an open channel to speak to the parents, then you can tell them what's possible to do. And uh, you know, we've heard also of, of children here uh, who come to our facilities for hydrotherapy, which isn't possible to do at home. But the hydrotherapist still maintained a, a, a line of communication with the children or with their parents, and over the phone told them, you know, these are the exercises we, re we recommend that you do. These are the things they do. And, and it was interesting talking to parents who've, who've received this, then they tell me that what helped the most is not the exercise itself, but just the continuous communication that the same therapist they were used to working with uh, over the last few months or few years is still talking to them according to the regular routine. Uh, uh, even if the exercises aren't, exercises aren't as effective as they would be if they were in the hydrotherapy pool. So I think keeping an open communication throughout all these times, if it's with a basic technology of just a phone or video is even better and internet is even better. Okay, thanks, Samir. There's a um, more of a technical question on um, if you use surveys uh, for the population and the needs of people with disabilities, and if you do, is there a way that you can share this survey or this questionnaire? Uh, we do a lot of surveys because we have a research department and one of one of the main ways for them to to collect data is a survey monkey and uh, and using questionnaires with uh so whatever we do we'll always have questionnaires i suggest and and we'll definitely be able to share that knowledge uh with other people uh, whoever asked that question i invite you to, to contact me you'll have my email here in a second on the screen uh, tell me what areas you're interested in and I'll, I'll just connect you directly to the research department so you can uh, see it. We also have on our website uh, knowledge sharing. So you can see all you know in the website of badizishapiro.org.il. Uh, you'll have there all of our uh, knowledge. Most of it will be in Hebrew, but there's a lot of information there in English as well. Now, also, I'll get back to this screen, uh, like this one before here. We also have a tech blog called Tech It Easy, uh, which is in English, Arabic, and in Hebrew. So all of you can uh, join this and you'll get e email updates whenever the new, po new posts there. Uh, there were not a lot of posts throughout the, the crisis now on different technologies that can help people throughout this uh, crisis when they're at home. So I think that would be a big help for many of you. I like that name, take it easy. <laughs> it's great. Uh, okay. Another question from uh, someone. Are you planning to work in other countries, especially in Africa? Question from Ezra. Uh, we're working a lot in South Africa already. I mean, we were working in South Africa literally until the, the days before the crisis. Uh, we're doing training there, and hopefully we'll continue doing training there for professionals. Uh, for example, on how to use what's called the snoozling rooms, or multi-sensory therapeutic environments. Uh, we've developed a lot of techniques to use that uh, in a professional manner for therapy. And we're working with Bella Vista in South Africa, uh, which is an organization there, so they can train. We're training the trainers there. Uh, 
We, I know we worked in Uganda in the past and in other countries, so we're, we're open to different options. Uh, one of the things we've done in many places in the world is consult on how to build inclusive playgrounds. Uh, we've done that in South America and a few countries in the UK. And I think that's what was done in Uganda as well. Uh, we've helped uh, consulting in China on how to create early intervention centers on the format that we do them in Israel. So yes, the answer is definitely yes. Okay, I think uh, I think that's the end of the, the the questions in our session with you, Amir. Maybe so, if you could put yeah. I'll, I first I'll share this with you, which you can take a picture right. of if you want to. Uh, it's a list of resources that are relevant for children with disabilities that can help any any family and any child. Each one is different, so just you know, go into the different links and that'll help you. They're not Beatty Shapiro. Uh, we're not getting money from them. Uh, it's just uh, area, places that we found can be very helpful. And this is my, these are my contact uh, details and our website in English. So you're welcome all to contact me whenever you want to, and we'll be happy to share and to partner and to work together with everybody. So I'd really like to thank you very much, Amir, for joining and sharing uh, so, some of your experiences with us. I think it's been a really wonderful lecture. Um, and, and I think we all see that we have so much more to learn as well. Um, and thank you to everyone else for joining us today. Um, of course, you have uh, our email, so if you have any questions, you have Amir's email, you have our email that you received from the, during the registration, please feel free to reach out to us. And um, thanks again to Amir. Thank you. Thank you for, all the, for the opportunity. Thank you very much.